We are in the Gospel of Mark, and as we've been going through it, we've been looking at how Jesus is the servant and how we can follow in his footsteps and be a servant as well. A lot of that shows up through Mark. Of course, we're going to study it verse by verse through the text and discover what the text is talking about. But uh, that's, that's the broad theme, that Jesus is the servant, and with a capital S there, the greatest one. And there's these great events that the Gospel of Mark records between Jesus and his disciples. There's a bunch of them. We just saw how Jesus sent out his disciples, the 12, on a missions trip. It was a short-term trip, about three months is what most scholars think. And then they come back from that, and they're totally tired. So Jesus says, let's go aside by ourselves and rest a while. So they get into the boat. A bunch of people are on the seashore, and they see the boat, and they run along the seashore. It says the, the men and the young, young boys ran. So they ran ahead to get there first, apparently, ahead of everybody. And, but everybody follows along, and all of a sudden, they're at this deserted place where no one lives on this grassy hillside on the northern end of the Lake of Galilee, and there's 10,000 or so people there. Right? They're all alone. They get a time of rest. No, they don't. They get to minister again, a real full day of, of work that they've, they're um, having to be involved in there. And then with the text we're going to look at today, Jesus then sends them out in a boat alone, and he goes up the mountain to pray, and he sends off the multitude. And they're going to spend the whole night awake, rowing as hard as they can. And they're, they're going to be exhausted, right? They're already exhausted. And then this, and then one thing. And so all these great pictures, what I'm telling you is there's these great pictures through the Gospel of Mark of Jesus and his disciples. Jesus and his disciples, these events we get to look at. And uh, he's preparing them. He is preparing them to live out their calling that they have, right? Right? for what they're called to do with their lives. They're called to serve God. They're called to be a part of his kingdom, to store up treasures in heaven. They're called to have greater purposes in life, and, and they're, they're to use their lives uh, unto, unto his purposes and so forth. So greater meaning, greater joy, greater all those things. And to be part of the work God has for them, they need to be built up and prepared for that. So in the Gospels, we're sort of looking at that, how they're being prepared for that. He allows them to face a lot of difficulty right? They, they need to uh, ultimately end up with that purpose of being built up with him through the ups and downs and to come to the deeper grasp of really knowing who Jesus is. That's what they need. So um, coming up to where we're at now, we're going to be in Mark chapter 6, uh, verse 45, I believe. Let's have Bill come on up and, and read that to us. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethesda, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountains to pray. And when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. And then he saw them standing straining at the rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch in the night, he came to them walking on the sea and would have passed them by. And when they saw him walking out on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked to them and said to them, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. They went up to the boat, to them, and the wind ceased, and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure, and marveled. And when they had not understood about the loaves, because their heart was hardened. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate that. So, again, Jesus sends them out in the boat again, and they're going to be up all night, rowing against the tedious wind. And what should have taken them a few hours is going to take them all night long. And they're not getting anywhere, making no progress, so it seems. But again, Jesus has a purpose for them in this. He's using all these events in the furthering of their training and the raising up 
of his followers. It's imperative that they must know him. And again, I've likened it to trying to imagine being a salesman for a, a, a product you don't believe in or you don't actually know what it is you're selling. Like, how, how could you convince anyone? You, you yourselves don't believe in it at all. They, it's imperative that they know him personally first. And who is the Messiah? Who is Jesus? Now, we say we know who he is. He's God. He's, he's God incarnate. He's, he, you know, but practically, it's sometimes hard for me, hard for us, to grasp who he really is and that he's with us in a moment of trial or testing or just all the time. Sometimes it's hard to grasp that practically. Like theologically, I know who Jesus is. I have no doubt, no question about who he is. But practically in a, in a given moment, sometimes it's hard to know the reality of who he is with me. So there seems to be that, well, a thick wall between my ears and my mental capacity to understand the spiritual reality. And uh, we have to see and hear and then see and hear again and again and again, and our understanding has to be enlightened, right? It's a spiritual thing, too. We need to pray that our understanding's enlightened, and it, it, we need to grow in our understanding of who Jesus is all the time. So this seems like a really tough test. Again, it's a test he's allowing them to go through, but Jesus is lovingly revealing himself to his disciples once again. And by the way, that's Paul's prayer. In Philippians 3.10, it says, that I may know him, the fellowship of his sufferings uh, and being conformed to his death, that I may know him, that I may know him. That's Paul's prayer. Here's at the end of the day, I want to finish my race and I want to know him. And many times I've made that my prayer in Philippians 3.10. So why don't we pray right now and let's, let's pray to that end. Dear Jesus, we want to know you. We want to know you intimately. We want to know you as you are. We want uh, any conceived perception we have of you to be put up against the reality of who you are, and the reality of who you are would overwhelm us, Lord, would, would just be what we clearly know and see. Please, Lord, we thank you that, that the scriptures reveal who you are. They bear witness. Your works bear witness to who you are. The Father bears witness to who you are. The Spirit bears witness to who you are. And Lord, we thank you that, that we are a work in progress and you're continuing to reveal yourself to your bride, your church. And one day we're going to get to see you as you are. One day we're going to get to see you in all your glory. We're going to get to be with you in your presence without melting away. We get to stand. And I thank you, Lord Jesus. You're fitting us for the kingdom of heaven. You're building us up. We give you praise this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. First thing we see in this text of Mark chapter 6 in verse 45 is three directions of those gathered at the hillside uh, of the grass um, at the northern end of the lake that, that spring day. Jesus sends the multitude away. He sends his disciples out on a boat into the, into the sea, and he goes up on the mountain to pray. So three different directions. He disperses this event, this crowd, right? And in John's gospel, this, is, this event was recorded in all the gospels, but the event of them in the sea is recorded in three of the gospels. And uh, in John's gospel, at the end of the feeding of the 5,000, it shares at the end of the teaching that the, the multitudes wanted to make Jesus king. He sent his disciples away, and the multitudes want to make him king and take him and make him king by force, right? And... I think maybe possibly he didn't want his disciples privy to that. He sent them off. I'm not sure, but they had these political motives. The masses did. And, and I want to correct what, something I said last week. I said I wasn't uh, sure whether they, the people knew it was a miracle when he was multiplying, breaking the bread and, the, and handing out the fish and multiplying it. I think from John's gospel account, it's clear that they did know it was a miracle because they understood, whoa, he's, he's multiplying food and they wanted to make him king. So I just wanted to make a correction on that, but that they likely did know. They had false messianic expectations, false messianic expectations. And, and they, they didn't understand the plan of God's Messiah, the plan of Jesus Christ, that he was going to go die on the cross for the world's sin, that he was going to change the heart and create a kingdom from the heart and then bring his kingdom down and so forth, that it's not of the kingdoms of this world. 
You know, all the kingdoms of this world are going to become under his throne. So anyhow, they had false expectations, and he certainly probably doesn't want his disciples involved with that. But uh, I, I think it's amazing how he sent them away just to begin with. Like, how do you do that? This vast multitude and 10,000, how do you, okay, go home now. You know, party's over or whatever. It's like late at night. I just think that's amazing. He spent the whole day teaching them, loving on them, healing people, feeding them, and then he sends them away. But I would like to see that personally, uh, that leadership. But he went up on the mountain to pray. He needed that time with the Father. And then in verse 47, it says, when evening had come. That's the second time it says evening had come in the text. So there's the sort of the first evening. The sun is beginning to set. It's, gonna, it's evening time. And then evening comes. It's dark. Okay. Um, it's dark. The boat with the disciples in it is out in the sea. Jesus is alone on the mountain. People have gone to their homes. That's the scene. And now the whole scene focuses on the disciples in the boat in the sea, okay? They're likely a few miles out in the open water. They went away from the shore, and they are straining at rowing, straining at rowing. Bassanizo is the word for straining, bassanizo. And it, this is a crazy word. It means torment, pain, to toss, vex, toil. It's this word that means to test, metals by the touchstone, which is a black uh, silly, silicious stone used to test the purity of gold or silver by the color of the streak produced on it by rubbing it with either material. So you could tr test precious metals by rubbing it on this black silicious stone, this touchstone. And that's what's happening. They're, it, they're being tested. It also means to uh, question by applying torture to put something to the test, to see what it's made of, to test by applying, uh, question something by applying torture. Wow, what are you made of? <laughs> uh, to vex, bassanizo, straining, to vex with grievous pains, a body or mind, to torment, to be harassed, to be distressed. They certainly are being tested. The straining at the rowing, the straining at the oars in the boat is a test for them. And, you know, does who I believe, who he is, match up against who he really is? My faith is in him, but who do I believe that he is, right? My faith is in, an, is in the object of something, you know, it's objective, not subjective. So I trust this stool is going to hold me, right? But do I understand what this stool is made of? How much do I understand? Uh, you know, does it have three or four legs? How much do I understand the structure of it and so forth? So how much do we understand Jesus? We put our faith in him. That's, that's great. That's one thing. But to grow in the knowledge of who he is that we put our faith in, that's better. Does that make sense? So we want to grow in the knowledge of Christ, be built up in the knowledge of who he is. So circumstances, by the way, can do this to us. They, test, they can test our faith. It's a situation that can press my faith against the real person of Jesus. And what ends up happening is my faith is purified. Your faith is, is grown, is built up. So through circumstances, situations that are not pleasant, God builds our faith in him, right? He's for us. He's with us. Though we feel like we're dying in it and it's not going to go well, we end up having victory in him and so forth. So he's building it up. And so this is a great opportunity for a test. These guys are struggling hard against the wind. The wind would be coming at them from the northwest, likely, and all they could do to survive was to face the wind, it is to put their bow right into the wind. If they, if they let the side of their boat go to the wind, what's going to happen? They're going to capsize, right? So the idea in the text here about them straining at the rowing is they're rowing against it and they're facing the wind with all of their strength. It took all the 12 men, some of whom are fishermen, they're in agrarian culture, they're all strong men, guarantee. They're facing the wind in this boat as with all the might they can just to keep it from tipping over. By the way, they're not making any advancement we're not getting anywhere. And they're doing this for hours. They're not getting anywhere. Man, just turn the boat around and let the wind drive you, right? Where are they going to end up? 
right? Jesus said, go this way, though, to them. Not that way. So they're trying to obey. They're trying to follow God's will. They're trying to obey Jesus. They're wanting to head into it, and they don't want to go way down there. They, they don't. It, the wind would have just taken them way off course. So what are they going to do? They're going to try to be as faithful as they can. They face into it, and they row, and they row, and they just try to steer, and they're straining at the oars. No success, just tormenting straining. And the text tells us it's about the fourth watch of the night. Now, the Jews kept three watches. The Roman Empire kept four watches. So under the influence of, of Rome we're looking at here, that would be 3 a.m. And they've been at this for well over six hours. Well over, I think. So 3 a.m. is about the time that Jesus finally starts to come out towards them. Not to mention, again, they were working all day. They were serving that food. They, they had the people sit down. They had to do that. They, uh, I mean, before that, they were on their mission trip and they really needed rest. I think they are utterly, utterly exhausted. And the efforts would have been almost beyond their strength to keep this boat head in, into the headwind. So, um, as a side note, I just feel like I have to say, sometimes I feel like this. And it's just feelings, right? It's just feelings. Reality is a different matter than my feelings. But it's like I'm out in a storm and Jesus is somewhere on land. He's on land. And me and maybe my buddies or my wife and I or whatever, we're out in a storm and it's hard. And you don't, you don't feel like he's necessarily with you or something like that. Hey, this world is certainly tempest-tossed, to say the least. This world is a total mess. It's getting worse all the time. And it's like we're all in boats on an uncertain sea of turmoil with no hope of land or light. Well, Jesus is on land. He's at the right hand of the Father. He's, he has, he's, the firm footing is there. And there doesn't seem to be any security in this world. People are just looking from one boat to another boat to try to find what can solve this, what can get us out of this mess. It's not going to happen. You can't go from one boat to another boat. You're just going to remain in that dangerous situation, right? There's no security in this world. None. They're looking for greater security from that constant danger. Jesus is secure in heaven, isn't he? I don't, well, I don't, I'm not going to say I don't know. I'm going to say there isn't a possibly more secure location than God's throne. What can challenge God's throne? What can usurp God's throne? What can do anything against God's throne? Can you send a missile at it? A bomb at it? Can people, people try to accuse it all the time, but that's going to all fall short. Nothing can challenge God's throne. Nothing at all can move God's throne because of the one who sits on it. And people in the world are looking for some stable place. But Jesus is <laughs> in the most secure location of all, and he cannot be shaken, cannot be shaken. But everything down here can and will be shaken, can and will. And I'm just praying back to the situation where I feel like I'm in this sometimes. Either bring me to you or come to me. Let's do this, right? Let's, let's have the, I want to be with you, secure, <laughs> You know, bring me to you. I'd prefer that, you know, or you come to me. Let's just have this done. And it will work that way. He will come to his church. He will come and receive us to himself that where you may, where I am, there you may be also. As it says on the poster over here. So we're looking forward to that day. And we say Maranatha, that's a cry, that's a prayer. We expect Jesus's, uh, anticipate his, or long for his return. We long for his return. Jesus is going to return his second coming. It's imminent uh, for the rapture of the church, and we're looking forward to being with him. So how that will work? Well, he's going to come to us. Meanwhile, we're straining at rowing in the storm. And I just, hey, take us to the land above, right? So back to the scenario the disciples are in. They're tired. They're tossed. They're tormented by this wind. It's 3 a.m., and at this time, he came to them. Now, he could see them the whole time, by the way. Well, I'll share that verse in a minute. But he could see them, and now he came to them. He's walking on the sea and would have passed them by. That's verse 48, the second half of it. And it says he was walking on the sea. 
In verse 48, it says it. In verse 49, it says it again. He was walking on the sea. Later, it says they all saw him. He's clearly walking on the sea. It's without question. This is a miracle. He's not walking beside the sea. He's walking on, on the sea. That's what the original texts all say. Rationalistic attempts to explain away this miracle or other miracles are not based upon the gospel accounts. Only man's fallible mind. They are not based upon the gospel accounts. They're based upon man's own doubt and, and fickleness. So you cannot look at the Bible and say Jesus didn't perform miracles. You're not ever going to get that from the text of God's word. No way. They are in, the miracles of Jesus are inseparable from the gospels. You cannot separate them. To remove the supernatural and the miracles is to undermine the reliability of the gospels. And the message being that Jesus is God who's come to save us from sin, to give us eternal life by his loving act on the cross and his resurrection. And he's coming again as the creator of the world to rule it with righteousness. So it's a message of redemption and kingdom salvation. So if you believe that Jesus is the incarnate son of God, then he, the fact that he walks on the sea absolutely should have no difficulty. None. He's the incarnate son of God. Of course he can walk on the sea if he wants to walk on the sea. Even in this harsh wind? Yeah, even in this harsh wind. If you do not believe Jesus is the incarnate son of God, the text is clear. What do you have to say about that? What does someone have to say about that? What are you going to do with the text of the Bible? You don't have an answer, right? With the historical miracles of Jesus. So he's walking on the sea towards the disciples in the boat. And then it says at the end of verse 48, he would have passed them by and would have passed them by. What does that mean? We look at that and we think, I used to think, okay, he's coming toward the boat and then he's just going to walk past and keep walking. You know, and I, I really thought that. But looking more at this, that's not exactly the idea. Would is his desire. I would. I would that you would, right? Help or this or that. I would. Um, that's a desire. Them, of course, is his intended destination. Passed by, though, it doesn't mean walk past them. It means to come alongside them. So here's the picture. Jesus is walking towards them, and then he makes a turn and comes alongside them, parallel to the side of their vessel. Why? He's walking towards them and comes alongside them, parallel to it because he's going to have an interaction with them first. He's not just going to get right into the boat. He's going to talk to them. And he, and he wants this conversation to take place. And he's testing their faith. That seems to be his intention here. They saw, again, his miraculous power with multiplying the loaves and fish. Before that, of course, casting out the demons and healing the, the, the men and women that he healed. But now they're seeing this. It's just increasing all the time. Um, so will they recognize him as he walks on the sea? So verse 49 says, when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and they cried out. Looks like Jesus, but under the circumstances, he told us to go out on the boat and he went up the mountain to pray. That, how could it be Jesus, right? So the mind tries to put together what we know right? Jesus is on the land. We're out at the sea. It's hard to believe. So their minds reconcile what they know. And, and this is all happening fast. Come quickly to the conclusion. It's probably not Jesus, right? We're seeing a specter, a phantom, a ghost, a, a, an apparition is what it is, a spirit, right? An appearance. And naturally, as any grown rough fisherman would do, they cried out, that's what they do. They cry out. And the word is to shriek with horror. And guess what? Mark uses it elsewhere is when the demons were released and they shrieked with horror coming out of the people. That's the same word. They cried out. So these guys, ah, just like they really cried out. And why? Verse 50, for they all saw him and were troubled. Yeah, they were troubled. They were terrified. And notice it says they all saw him. They all saw him walking on the sea. They all, 12, saw him alongside their boat. They were physically and mentally overworked, yes, 
but it wasn't some subjective delusion that they had going on. They saw him, and they were terrified. So verse 50 again said, he, Jesus responds, Have courage, it is I, be not afraid. Three statements. Be of good cheer, it's I, don't be afraid. Three statements, and they're tied together. This is a beautiful verse. Have courage, or be of good cheer. The world will one day all see him. Every eye will see him, right? Every eye will see him. What's going to happen when the world sees him at large? They're going to be terrified. What's going to happen when his church sees him? We're going to be full of delight and joy, right? Visions of rapture now burst in my sight. You know, like it's going to be a delight. It's going to be so joyous. It's going to be the best thing ever, the best day ever. And so they're going to, the world is going to see him, but believers do not have to be terrified. We can take courage. We can take courage. Now, when we see him as well, it's, it's not going to be like the humble carpenter from Nazareth. He's going to be in his glory. He's going to be shining in his glory, which in a way, that's terrifying. Now, it was really neat because I was thinking earlier in the week and I was listening to some sermons and uh, looking at the book of Daniel and uh, Revelation and when Jesus uh, appeared to Daniel, he was robed in glory, okay? Daniel fell at his feet as though he were dead. He couldn't see. The same thing happens in Revelation. He's, his eyes were like a flaming fire or like lightning. His voice as many waters, thundering. You could hardly perceive it, and you didn't have the ability with your ears and eyes to see and receive all that he is and all his glory, it's too much. You know, Moses says, I want to see your glory. And God says, no, you're going to die if you see my glory. It's too much for you. And so why don't you hide here? I'll cover you and I'll just pass by. And you'll just get like a whiff of my glory, basically. Just a tiny, tiny portion as I pass by you. Otherwise, it's too much. And, and of course, the children at the bottom of Mount Sinai of Israel, they're, they're saying, no, you speak to him for us. It's, he's terrifying. It's too much. You know, God is going to fit us for heaven. We're going to get uh, glorified bodies, and we'll be able to see him as he is. We're going to get ears that are able to hear, though his voice is as the sound of many waters. We're going to be able to intelligibly understand all that he speaks in the ambience of his voice from his glory. We're going to be able to see, though he's like lightning. We're going to be able to see him. So yes, we're going to receive a glorified body without sin, but we're going to receive a glorified body without sin that is also, I think, upgraded beyond what we can imagine. We're going to have ears and eyes that can behold Jesus in all his glory. It's amazing. And of course, they're seeing him right here, and he's, he's in his human body. He looks like Jesus, but he's walking on the water. He's doing something very miraculous. And he's not robed in his glory at this point, but he's still terrifying. And when he comes in his glory to the world, the world is going to be so terrified. Of course, we are going to be changed in an instant, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. We're going to be changed. We're going to be more, uh, we're going to be glorified. Our bodies will be. So we'll be able to receive. We'll be able to stand in his presence. Very exciting. So, but be, he says, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. We can take courage. You know, they're in a hard situation. They're getting no advance. They feel like they were tortured. And he says, have courage. Now, Christians are called to go against the grain of this world. 1 Peter 4 tells us that we're doing that. We're going against the course of this world. And the world looks at us like we're crazy for doing it. They don't get it. Why we would run against the grain of the world, right? But we're going against the grain. And, and that's what these guys are doing. They're rowing against the wind. And he says, have courage in this process, guys. Have courage. It's I. It's like he always lets believers, his church, the body of Christ, be the underdogs. If you look at Hebrews chapter 11, what do you see? You see a list of underdogs. You see a list of those who have gone before us, who, though they were little, small, uh, meek, insignificant, un they had no sufficient resources. They had faith in him. And that's what Hebrews 11 is about, having faith in him. It's as though Christians are always on the edge of extinction, always on that edge, always in over our heads. 
I remember being at a pastor's conference about five years ago or so, and can't remember how long ago it was, but uh, someone I respect asked me how I was doing. I said, I, I was breaking, to be honest, emotionally. And I was like, I, I'm in over my head. I feel like I'm always in over my head. I've been in over my head for years, I tell him. And he goes, that's really good. <laughs> I'm like, tell me it gets better. He's like, just stay there. Honestly, this is what he says to me. And I'm thinking, wow. <laughs> but he says it's good. Why? Because he knows then you're in that place of dependence, right? <laughs> Feeling our limitations so severely. And, you know, he allows it. Why? Why did he allow the children of Israel with Moses to be at the edge of the Red Sea the sea is at their backs. They've got mountains on either side of them, and maybe a little valley pathway coming down that the Egyptian army is coming down that pathway to kill them all. You know, be of good cheer. God led you into this spot, right? You're here for his purposes. You know, we're here to die is what it feels like. And why does the text say in Genesis, why are they in that situation? That they might know him. That's why, that they might know he is God. He allows Gideon to be, you know, 30,000 men, Gideon. No, that's too many. 10,000 men, Gideon, too many. 300 men, Gideon, that's right. Then you'll know I'm God. Then you'll know there is a God in Israel, right? When it's impossible odds, when it's just too much in the situation we face. So he says, be of good cheer. Why? The second statement in verse 50 it is I. This is why. Because it's I. Yes, Jesus was really walking on the sea. And it was really him, not an appearance. You know, by the way, Jesus could see them. I said I'd mention this earlier. We'll come back to it now. In verse 48, it says he saw them straining at the oars. So when he was up on the mountain praying, he saw them. Why? Is that because he was up on the mountain and he had a vantage point he could see with a, the Passover moon? He could see them out there? Not likely. It's a miracle. I believe it's in there. I believe Mark recorded it to tell us it's a miracle that Jesus could see from his mountain up on high his people below in a ship on, out against the wind. Doesn't that speak of that greater picture of us and the Lord? From his mountain on high, he can see us and he knows we're in this situation. He knows where you're at. And he says, be of good cheer because he will come to us. And he does. And he comes and he says, why? Because it's I. It's I. So he can see that you're in a struggle. He can see you. And he doesn't despise our faithlessness or our, our hurting, you know, mind and body and all it is or whatever it is. And he just wants to say, be of good cheer. I'm with you. That's what he wants to tell us. That's what he wants to tell his church all the time. Be of good cheer. I'm, I'm with you. You know, this struggle, it tests my faith. It tr tests your faith. But he comes to encourage. He comes to encourage. God is an encourager to his church. And what's encouraging is knowing who he is and that he's present. Knowing who he is and that he's present. You know, it is I, by the way, is akin to, in the grammar, saying I am. Be of good cheer, I am. Which, of course, any of the Hebrews would know that that's making a statement, he's God. He's, he is Yahweh. He is God incarnate. So, be of good cheer, I am, is what he's telling them. And that should encourage us. It should, certainly. And the third statement, don't be afraid. So you have a positive command, be of good cheer. You have a negative command, which is don't. Don't be afraid. And what's in between those two commands? Be of good cheer. Don't be afraid. What's in between the two? The I am is in between the two. It is I. Jesus stands between those two. That positive command of being, being of good courage. I mean, when, when he told Joshua, you're going to go do this impossible thing, defeating the, the giants in the land and taking Canaan and so forth with all these complaining tribes with you. Like, how are we doing this? I'm with you. Be not afraid, right? Jeremiah, how am I going to be a prophet to a bunch of people that don't want to listen? Kings that want to throw me in pits. Like, how am I going to be a prophet to this nation that's so rebellious? I'm with you, Jeremiah. I've called you. I'm with you. Why? 
can you be courageous? Because he's with you. And so he stands in between these two commands and to not be afraid, instead be courageous. You know, what takes you, me, us from fear into courage? The person and presence of Jesus takes us from the place of fear to courage, from fear to courage. Circumstances often prompt fear. Things we don't understand also can prompt fear. So what prompts fear in my life? Things I don't understand and circumstances. And I'm afraid in those circumstances because I don't understand them. I'm afraid that I won't be safe. I'm afraid that I'm, I'm not in a secure place. This isn't secure. And so I get afraid and I want to be somewhere that is secure, right? Think about a social situation that's really awkward. You don't like being in that social situation because you feel it's not a secure place. You might get bullied again like you were in grade school. You might get laughed at or something might happen that's embarrassing. Think about a situation where, where you're afraid of being, you know, on a, on a cliff somewhere. You're afraid of cougars in the mountains or something else. You're, you're afraid because you're not safe. That's what you think, right? And so these things prompt fear in us and the body reacts and we get terrified possibly because we interpret the situation we are in to be an unsafe one for us. Now, we want to learn of God. We want to follow him. And Jesus watches over us all the time and he's with us as we follow him, right? So he says, be of good cheer and don't be afraid because I am and I'm with you. And if he's for us, who can be against us? And if anything that we think is negative and horrible that happens to us and we're walking in his will, be of good cheer. He's allowed it for his purposes and his glory. And it's not a bad thing. It's not ultimately going to be working against you, but for you, for a far greater, uh, far greater weight of glory. Excuse me. So we can overcome fear with our faith in who he is and that he is for us. It's not just a um, supposed faith, you know, a hopeful, like, eh, maybe. He is the I am. Our faith is in something so solid and secure is what I'm wanting to really share. So verse 51, he went up into the boat. Uh, by the way, Matthew's account alone shares the portion of Peter walking on the sea. This happens in this scene where Jesus, if it's you, Lord, call me to come out to you, right? If it is you. And he says, all right, let's go. And Peter, Peter walks out and he takes him by the hand and when his eyes go off Jesus and so forth. And I think maybe perhaps Mark, which is uh, most likely that's Peter's rendition of the Gospels and Mark is pinning it for on behalf of Peter. And Peter probably admits it, just being humble and not wanting to highlight, you know, this uh, portion where he has such great faith and walks out on the water with Jesus. But Jesus went up into the boat and I think up into the, he's like, probably, I don't know, like, floating what do you step on steps that weren't there and just like just goes up into the boat i just it's so cool right so he goes up into the boat and um it may feel often like he's not in that boat with me but he is he's with us he's with his church he's given us his spirit first corinthians three sixteen. right do you not know that you are the temple of god and the spirit of god dwells within you as many as are born by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. You're the children of God. God is not going to let his kids always get beat up forever and they get be in that situation. No, he, he allows, again, those underdog situations and those feelings of desperation so that he can reveal more of who he is to us and build our faith in him. So look at their response in 51. They were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled. Yeah, but this is a really strong statement. So... The manuscripts use a double superlative here. Look at it again, verse 51. Greatly amazed in themselves, beyond measure and marveled. It's exceedingly beyond measure. The amount of words here suggests that their amazement was greater than there was just reason for. You think, my amazement was greater than there was just reason for? I would be totally amazed. Are you kidding me? You know, I'd be exceedingly odd too, but just odd is enough? I'm like, what are you talking about here? What? Well, apparently, maybe we shouldn't expect such, you know, that, that maybe we shouldn't think it's strange that Jesus could do such a thing. Put it that way, right? An expression of his power. 
Maybe we shouldn't be so shocked that he could walk on the water, is the idea. Fair enough now, right? Fair enough. Am I going to be so shocked when Jesus comes and heals the world and turns everything around and wipes his enemies off the map? Is he gonna, am I going to be so shocked? How shocked are you going to be when Jesus shows up and does his business? Hopefully we're not too shocked. Hopefully we expect it, right? Let's get our biblical minds going here. And hopefully it's not going to be so shocking. So that's, that's just an admonition there, that we shouldn't be so surprised how things turn out, right? I think in one way we're going to be surprised because we look at the mess in the world and we think, how are you going to do it, Lord? Oh, he's going to do it. Let's just anticipate he's going to do it. He's going to do great things. Let's grow in our faith in him and expect great things of him. Jesus is going to do awesome things despite all we see and feel around us all the struggles, trials, and the mess in the world. Because he sees, he knows, and he is certainly greater than all. So let's close by looking at the last verse here, 52. Verse 52, <clears throat> Mark 6. It's kind of a, a curveball, it seems like. For they, have not, they had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened. And that's backing up what I'm talking about, that they were a little too shocked in verse 51. Because 52 is a commentary on that. For, you know, they... Why were they so shocked? Because they didn't understand about the loaves, is what 52 is saying. That's the commentary of why I can say they were too shocked. They didn't understand about the loaves? What didn't they understand about the loaves? What did they not understand? about? Their heart was hardened. These are the disciples. Their hearts were hardened. What is this about? And it really does appear to be, it's just a curveball here, but let's try to get into it. This is an explanation for their total astonishment in verse 51. They just saw the loaves and fish multiplied, but failed to grasp the larger lesson, which simply is who Jesus really, really, really is. He is God. And they just weren't quite there yet. Does that make sense? They weren't totally there yet. He's God? And so now they see him walking on the sea, who is this? They're terrified. If it is you, call me out. Oh, he gets into the boat and they're so shocked. They still weren't quite there yet going, Jesus is God, right? He's living with them. He's being with them. They're comfortable in his presence and they're seeing him do amazing things, but he's God. He's Yahweh. And so this is a bit much, right? Um, Mark 4, 11 tells us that they were given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. They were blessed because to them it was given to know the mysteries. But here it says they didn't understand about the loaves and fish because their heart was hardened. That God became a man. Now the heart includes the intellectual nature as it relates to the supernatural or spiritual. The intellectual nature as it relates to the spiritual. Uh, we often always say, you know, our 18 inches from the head to the heart. It's hard to get things from the intellect to the heart. One thing I heard David Hawking say was that in the Hebrew thought and understanding, the mind and the heart were the same thing. They weren't separated from each other like we always put it. You've got the organ down here and the organ up here, right? The mind and the heart. That's apparently a Western way of thinking. But he said that the mind and heart, it's all one. It's in your bowels. It's not up here or here. It's down in your bowels. Oh, whoa, that's a whole other place. So... Um, the heart, listen, includes, this is a statement I, I want us to grasp, the intellectual nature as it relates to the spiritual. Because your mind, your intellectual nature does relate to the spiritual, right? Well, how much does it relate to the spiritual? Basically, what's going on is they didn't get the spiritual reality of what was happening, especially as it relates to the identity of Jesus. In simple words, they were, with their minds, with their intellect, they were being spiritually imperceptive. Spiritually imperceptive. They were seeing what was going on. They were experiencing all, but there was something spiritually imperceptive also. That's the hardening of the heart. That's what's going on here. It wasn't willful disobedience or obstinance. They weren't being willful. It was just a sluggishness of spiritual awareness, of mental spiritual awareness being slow to get it, and fair enough. I often don't relate his power or presence to what's happening in my life, right? 
I was on the ferry this week, and it was just so beautiful with this weather we had. And it, there wasn't a storm by any means. It was the morning ferry, so it was like glass out there. But you know how big these ferries are. And another one passed me because we're going to the active pass area and stuff. And so another one passes us. <clears throat> and I saw, I was looking at first at its, its bow. And, and there you've just got this great wall of water being pushed up. I was like, wow, that's, that's a bunch of water it's moving because the hole must go deep. And then uh, it was pretty smooth, and I watched how it rippled with these kind of two nice ripples along the side. And then uh, from the stern, it had a big wake come out, this huge wake. And I thought, wow, we're going we're gonna to hit that wake. I wonder what's going to happen when we hit it. And I thought, yeah, it's, we're gonna, are we going to feel the bumps? Are we going to really feel it when we hit the wake of that giant ship? And we uh, got to the point, and I think th that we hit the wake. Like, I know it went under us, but I didn't feel it. I didn't feel the wake, you know? I thought, that's interesting. I mean, there might have been a little something, maybe. So you guys get the picture? When, when I was, um, well, there's many times. We, we went out fishing, and, you know, you hit a wake. You're in a little boat, and if you hit that same wake, you're going to slam, like, right? You hit one of those wakes. But being in such a large vessel the wake and hitting it was imperceptible. Like, it was nothing, really. So I was surprised. Hardly anything happened. Again, a small boat would feel it, but on the sixth deck of this large ship, I wasn't even sure whether I did. Jesus could walk on the sea in the wind that 12 men are struggling with all their might to keep the boat headlong into. He's walking in the sea. Uh, for some reason, I think his... His tunic and stuff is blowing, but he's not even moving. It's not affecting his muscles. Like, he's not straining, like, oh, like the guy coming through the storm at back home after, you know, checking his hunting traps or something like that. Like, nothing. He's just, like, as if he was on a stroll. I think that would freak me out. I'd be like, who is this guy? Just walking on the water, right? Now, think about that. He's above it all. He's unaffected by it all. But what he is affected by is our distress. What he is affected by is what, the, he, saw what he saw on the mountain. Amen. Thank you. He's the I am. He's the magnanimous creator. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He's ever-present God. And as we face trials, tests, we're learning about who <laughs> he is. And we'll close with what Matthew's account says. Matthew's account <laughs> says in verse, uh, at chapter 14, verse 33 of this same uh, scene, they said, quote, truly, you are the Son of God. That's the closure of the scene. Truly, you're the Son of God. Well said, right? See, at the end of it, we'll know, surely, he's the Son of God. And they need this the next time, uh, the next day, really. A test is coming where Jesus will uh, send many, many followers are going to leave him. Because it's the scene where he says he's, he's the bread of life and that he's the incarnate son of God. People need to receive of him. And it's a hard, hard saying. So he's preparing them for this, right? He's going to be preparing them for that. And they are going to be ready to receive it because truly he is the son of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you reveal our Savior to us, and we just pray for more revelation all the time by your Spirit, that you would help us, Lord, to not be limited by our uh, circumstances, by our own thoughts, and by what we see in the world, how we, we can't figure out how you're going to do it. We can't figure out how we're going to get out of it. We can't figure out things, but Lord, we need to lift our eyes above to know that you are with us, to know that you're for us, to know that, Jesus, you died for us, you rose again for us, and surely you've given us your Holy Spirit, and surely, Lord Jesus, you're coming again for your bride. And so, God, we thank you. Would you just secure our hearts in this knowledge? Anchor us with this hope. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your soon coming. We thank you for the anchor, and uh, Lord, help us not to determine our fate by looking at our circumstances. 
but help us to determine our fate by looking on our Savior. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Yeah, please.